Good morning. We welcome you. We still got people uh, filtering in here this morning. And uh, if you're watching this on delay, it's because you forgot to set your clock. And uh, that's okay. I'm wondering if we'll have people wander in a little bit late because they forgot to set their clock. But we're glad to have you here this morning if you're watching on the stream or if you're watching later on delay. And we're glad to have all of you who are here. And uh, we're excited to worship together today. And uh, we'll have some announcements here in a few minutes uh, as we've got a few things going on and we want to alert you to. But right now, I'm gonna, we're going to open with a word of prayer and then Cody's going to come. And we're going we're gonna to sing a song. And uh, so please join me in prayer right now. Good morning, Father. Lord, we thank you so much for the chance we have to come together, to worship together, whether we're together here in this room, whether we're on the stream, whether we're gathered in a gather group. Uh, however we're connecting, Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to worship you and to be connected to each other. Lord, we pray so much for our world right now as so many places are struggling and so many countries are struggling and as uh, so many are still uh, up against this, we, Lord, we know there are many people who are sick and many who are struggling and then as we come into winter, we know it's a tough time. Lord, we uphold our nation, we uphold our world, we uphold all those who need your hope. Lord, may we be a light uh, in their life, may we share with them your love for them. So Lord, just be with our time today, refresh us, encourage us and equip us for the week ahead. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, well, the magic didn't work. <laughs> so Cody's going to come, and we're going to sing Abide With Me. Uh, we are encouraging people. Uh, I, I would like to encourage you. Uh, you notice I have my mask on. Uh, that especially while we sing, it would be better if you wore your mask, if you're going to sing. If you're not going to sing, it doesn't matter. But singing is one of the more contagious activities we can do, and uh, the less we put it all out in the air, the better. And if you have bad breath, then, you know, you're your own punishment. Oh. So, anyway, we're going to sing Abide With Me this morning. I have a home, eternal home, but for now I walk this broken world. At first, you know our pain, but you show hope can rise again up from the grave. Abide with me, abide with me, don't let me fall, and don't let go. Abide with me, abide with me, don't let me fall, and don't let go, walk with me, and never leave, ever close, God abide with me, oh love that will not ever let more and sing for joy abide with me 
we'll weep no more and sing for joy. Abide with me. Abide with me. Abide with me. Don't let me fall and don't let go. Walk with me and never leave. Ever close, God abide with me. Ever close, God abide with me. Ever close, God abide with me. Amen. All right. Let's do some announcements here. <coughs> so uh, first, I forgot to mention first service, we are doing 3 o'clock study today here, and it will be on Facebook Live. It will not be on Zoom, but it will be on Facebook Live. So that's at 3 o'clock today. Uh, Operation Christmas Child we're doing. If you're interested in doing a shoebox, the information's in the lobby uh, there by the bulletin board if you want to pick up stuff there. On November 6th, we're hosting a blood drive. The uh, Red Cross is going to be here. There, as of this morning, there were nine spots left. So if you'd like to sign up to give blood, you have to go on the Red Cross website. Uh, there are nine spots left. We hope that you'll sign up because uh, we're eager to get uh, all the spots filled. Uh, the Red Cross needs that. So that's coming up. You may have heard we had our trunk or treat yesterday. And uh, because uh, we, we made a change, turned it into a drive through And that was a good thing. Uh, because it was insane. We had, uh, they started 10 minutes early, we already had people coming, and right through to the end, we had people actually, we were packing up, almost everyone was gone, and we still had a couple more cars come through, we had to go scrounge to give them something. We had approximately, within, I'm, this is within two or three cars, we had approximately 155 cars. And a few cars had one kid, some cars had two kids, and a bunch of cars had three, four, or five kids. So we're, we averaged, we decided to average on the conservative side about two kids per car, which is probably more than that average, but we averaged two. So that's over 315 kids that came through. Uh, partway through, we had to send someone on an emergency run to go buy a ton more candy at Walmart and, and restock because everybody was running out. Uh, and... Uh, I'd say probably over 85% were not people who are part of our fellowship. And uh, it was really amazing. We had to see a lot of people. And the overwhelming response was, thank you so much for having something. And uh, we're glad we did. We slipped to drive through because if, if it had been walk through, it had been chaos. We wouldn't have been able to keep the distancing. It wouldn't have been safe. So really glad for that. Uh, if you didn't already get the notice and understand and know this, that we did have a, a person attend an, an event last week. Uh, in good faith, and then one of our events here, and then after having attended an event here, did, turn, uh, did po test positive and develop symptoms of COVID-19. And so we have a bunch of people right now who are quarantined, who, who were exposed there. The good news is the whole point of why we do these and, and distance and have the, the purple groups, the whole point is, is not that people won't catch it, because it's, people are going to catch it, it's in the community. The goal is that we don't spread it faster and have, have one case turn into to 10, especially among the more vulnerable, which is what the group was that had the exposure. And as of this time, it's worked, which is the whole point, it works. And uh, at this point, we've had no spread that we know of. We're excited for that. But that's why I'm uh, wearing my mask today to, to be a better example of that, and we're encouraging that and distancing because it works. And uh, they're finding that it does help reduce it. And I actually saw an article today that they said, uh, even if you get sick, if you get a less of a dose, you don't get as sick because it gives your body a, a leg up because you don't get uh, as much virus to start with. And so it gives your body a head start to fight against it. Uh, I compare it to wearing your seatbelt because, you know, I have a, I, uh, not a friend, but I a classmate when I was in high school who died in a car accident. The seatbelt killed him uh, because of the violence of the accident. Now, I don't know if he, if he had a seatbelt, he might have died as well. But I wear my seatbelt every time. Why? Because it is generally effective. And it doesn't mean it's always going to save your life. It means that you will be safer. And uh, these things aren't, they're not guarantees, but they are things we do to save. And in this case, the life you save might not be your own. 
So we want to try to love our neighbor. And so we're going to continue to be really careful with that. So if you also didn't see, I posted it to my Facebook page last night. But some people, I think, maybe didn't read carefully because they were making comments on my share as if they were writing to me. Uh, But our sister church, Hope Baptist Church down in Manchester, they've had numerous uh, positive tests. None of it seems to have spread through their church. But uh, numerous members of their church have all tested positive, and so as of yesterday, they have closed down for two weeks. They were supposed to have a trick-or-treat off-the-street event today, and they have canceled that, and they have also canceled all their in-person services for the next two weeks, trying to love their community. And so we need to be praying for Hope Baptist. For a lot of you remember Brian, that was our youth pastor and youth leader here for a couple of years, and uh, so he's down there. And uh, they're doing well, but they are taking a couple weeks from in-person And uh, so we need to just pray for them. So anyway, I think those are all the announcements. And uh, we're going to talk more about church and all this stuff and the changes uh, as part of the sermon today as we look at this. So I'll save that for later. So now we're going to go check out my workshop again. And so if there are any kids, uh, this is for you. Hi, guys. How you doing? Good to see you. Well, I can't really see you, but you can see me. And I don't know if you noticed, but we're back out in my workshop. And I've got a couple things that I want to show you today. And I bet you know what at least one of them is. And I bet you know what both of them is. All right. So here's my first one. You know what this is? Do you recognize that? It's glue. That's right. Glue. So this is glue. Do you know what glue is for? Do you know what you use glue for? Of course you do. You use it to, to fix things or to to put things together and uh, make them stay together. Now I have a second thing I'll show you here. Do you know what this is? That's right, this is, a, this is called a clamp, which actually, it kind of looks like a C. C for clamp. So this is a clamp, and you, you tighten it up here on this end. And so, like if you glued, glued a couple pieces of wood together, and then you could then clamp it and hold it until the glue dried. And so those can come in handy, especially if you have something that's broken. I have a couple of different projects. I have little things that broke, and I need to glue them back together. And I use glue and clamps to to get them back together so that they'll stay together. Now, do you know that a lot of things break? Now, you might have had a broken toy, You might have had something that broke before. I've had a lot of different things that break. And sometimes, do you know, especially with grown-ups, sometimes people break. Now, I don't mean like a broken arm or a broken finger. What I mean is sometimes people have trouble getting along. You ever get along, have trouble getting along with someone? You ever have a fight with someone? Well, sometimes grown-ups don't get along well either. And then maybe they stop being friends or they stop being around each other. And sometimes we call that a break-up. And sometimes it's kind of very sad when people stop being friends. And all through all through time, a lot of people have gotten mad at other people and stopped being friends and stopped loving each other. And that is really sad. That's even more sad than like if your toy gets broken. But what's really cool is just like I have glue and and clamp here to help me fix things you know jesus wants to fix things too and jesus wants to bring people back together there's a really big word that i bet you don't know it's called reconciliation that's a big word isn't it reconciliation and what it means is bringing back together people who were apart and the biggest reconciliation the biggest thing that god ever fixed was us and him you know because we sinned and we do bad things which separates us from god and god said i want you to be near me i want to be with you and so he sent jesus to die on the cross so that we could be with him and jesus made it so we could be with him again he fixed the relationship. He put it back together. That's really cool. And when we let Jesus put our relationship back together with God, it can also help us put our relationships back together with each other. And we can learn to forgive each other. 
And that's pretty cool. So just like in my workshop, I'm going to try to fix some things and put some broken things back together. We need to let Jesus in his workshop, let God put us back together with him and with each other. So I hope that if you ever have a broken relationship, that you'll let God fix it. It's going to be hard. It got to take some work. And sometimes it kind of, you kind of got to get a little squeezed. But God wants to bring us back together. Let's try that word one more time. Reconciliation. That's a big word. Hey, I miss not being around you. But even though we're not together right now, where I don't always get to see you, I hope that you know that I still love you and that we're still together in the biggest way it counts and that we can love each other. And I can't wait to when I get a chance to see you. But I hope you have a great day. I hope that you had a good week and a good weekend. Got some candy maybe. And I can't wait to see you. But have a good day. Bye-bye. I apologize that the, 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 the sound and the picture got out of sync. That was something to do with my phone when I recorded that. I don't know why. Uh, and, and just a, just another little side note, if you, you it might be harder here, but on the if you're watching on the stream, you might hear it. Uh, you can hear me whistling when I breathe. When I take an in, when I take an in breath, you hear the <clears throat> because I, my, this has been about the worst fall I've had in a long time as far as my asthma goes. Uh, I've had a really bad fall, and usually I do pretty well, but this year has been really rough. And uh, so, but it also means that I mean, I this morning I came in, I was puffing pretty bad with my asthma. But I can do this, and uh, if I can sing and preach with this, it's with asthma. We're in our new series, Coming Together or Coming Apart. And uh, as I was praying through our Hope series about what's coming next, where, where does God want us to go? Where, where, what is God trying to say to us as a church, as a people? Uh, what, you know, and, and obviously, it's always uh, a journey I'm on myself as, as God is, is leading me through things. And this idea of, of just, what does it mean to come together? Because that's one of the big things right now with, with all the stuff going on. And uh, I, I grew up, I, I like to say I, I grew up in Chesterville, but I lived in southern Maine. So I grew up in Chesterville, but we called it Limington. And some of you might know where Limington is. It's a little town in southern Maine that's a lot like Chesterville. I lived on a back road on a hill. And now I live on a back road on a hill in a little town. So I feel like I've come full circle. But uh, living in Limington... And it was, uh, it, it was tough because there wasn't very many houses on our road, and so there wasn't a lot of kids, but there were two other boys who lived on the road with me that were about my age. I was the oldest, but we were all pretty close in age within a, a year and a half. And if three of us got together, one of us got left out. So usually we only got together in twos because that way nobody got left out. And if, if the three of us got together and one of us left out, it was usually me. And I didn't like that. And it was tough. And so here's the big truth is we long to belong. We long to connect. Now, how we want to connect and who we want to belong to may vary depending on who we are. Like some people want to be popular with a lot of people. Other people really, as long as they have at least one friend, that's good enough. But we all, we really, unless you're really damaged, unless you've really been hurt in a way, most people do not want to be completely alone. Uh, most people want to at least belong to someone, have someone that they love. And yet, it's hard. It's hard because sometimes it seems to hurt as much as help. Sometimes these relationships that we long to have go bad and they, and they hurt us. We have divorce, disputes, separation of friends, getting left out. And so we have this long history of we want the relationships, but then the relationships hurt us, and the relationships are hard. And then what about church? Well, church is supposed to be the ultimate, hey, let's come together, right? And we'll love each other and worship together and be connected as a church. And I grew up in a church where I remember at one point, uh, my dad wasn't coming to church yet. He didn't usually go with us. Later he did. And something had happened at church. It was a business meeting, whatever. And uh, mom came home, and dad's line was, what, are the Baptists fighting again? Because that's what they were known for, you know? And churches are known for having fights and known for having disputes and, and splits. And, and it gets rough. 
And so we, we struggle with how do we connect and how do we be one as a church and, and do I belong and all this stuff. And that was before we had COVID. And now we have restrictions and, and, and you know, masks and, and distancing and, and sometimes not even having in-person services. And so then what do we do when Sunday morning isn't what I want it to be? And a lot of people, like, you might this morning be saying, you know, I miss it. Because, hey, I come and I, don't, I can't see everyone. And I can't visit the way I used to visit. And, the, you know, we don't have the band. And, and it's not the same feeling. And we've been in, we're, and so then what do we do? We start feeling disconnected. And that's the feeling we hate. To feel disconnected. And, and so we struggled with this. And we're struggling with this now. What does it mean to be church? And if I, if I don't feel connected Sunday morning... Am I still in church? Am I still part of the church? What does it mean to come together? And are we coming apart? And so this whole series is going to do kind of a deep dive, and we're going to look at this and say, what does it mean to come together? How do we come together? Why do we need to come together? And why do we keep coming apart? And even in this time where we're, again, in in a period of time where coming together is different than what we're used to. I mean, this is different, right? And we don't like different. But what was interesting is like yesterday when we did the trunk or treat, it was different, but it was good. But it wasn't the way we like it. I mean, it would have been nice to be able to get everybody out of the things and just have the huge crowd. It wouldn't have been smart. But I remember I talked to Pete afterwards because Pete and his family were helping giving out candy. And Pete made the great comment. He said, you know, we did it. We made two good decisions. Because as we knew we were suddenly facing some possible exposure, we could have canceled. But we chose not to cancel, but we chose to do drive through because we needed to connect, but we needed to do it safely. So how do we do this? So this is what we're going to talk about this next few weeks. So let's start with Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to start with where it all started. And we're going to build this over the next few weeks. Genesis 2, I'm going to start in verse 25, which is the the last verse in in chapter 2, and then we're going to dive into chapter 3 and see what happens. And for some of us, we're very familiar with these stories. We're very familiar with Genesis. But let's look at it. So Genesis 2.25, talking about the, the end of the creation time, and Adam and Eve have been made, they've been brought together, and it says in verse 25... And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. All right? The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, chapter 3, we're going to go through, we're going to skip over the whole temptation. Most of us know the story. If not, you read it in the first seven verses, or the first six verses of chapter 3, where the, the snake came, the serpent came, and tempted Eve to eat the fruit from the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. And she ate it. She gave it to her husband. They ate. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he, the Lord, said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now let's skip down to the end of the chapter, the last two verses of chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. All right, let's see what happens here. So they start, things are good. They have fellowship with God and with each other with total intimacy and openness. That's what it means there in verse 25 of chapter 2. They were both naked and were not ashamed. There was no hiding from each other. 
and from God. They were naked in the presence of God. And, and there was just no, there was like, oh, this is embarrassing. They weren't worried about what other people were seeing, what other people were thinking. They weren't worried about what they looked like. They weren't worried about the state they were in. This is total intimacy, total openness, comfort and security in each other. And it says, and there was no shame. They weren't, I feel kind of funny here. I feel a little awkward here. No, it was fine. They were just totally safe with each other and with God. They didn't have to worry about any kind of exposure. And that's what it means that they were, they were naked. It was, it was, they were completely open and totally honest, totally intimate, comfort and security, no shame. And, of course, the point is that changed fast. It changes incredibly quickly. Because once they have sinned, what do we have? It becomes shame. It becomes hiding. They hide twice, right? They hide first. They start sewing leaves together. And they sew the leaves together so they can hide their bodies from God and from each other. And then they hide literally from God. They're out hiding in the trees. Where are you? We're hiding. We feel ashamed. We're afraid you'd see us. We were naked, and we're even hiding ourselves from each other now. And then God says, well, what happened? And we use the phrase getting thrown under the bus, right? Adam immediately throws Eve right under the bus. And then God, because what do you say? God says, what did you do? Did you eat? Adam says, she made me, and you gave her to me. I mean, talk about spreading the blame, right? It was her and you. That's what happened, God. It was her fault and, and she's your fault. Well, that's nice. Do you notice how quickly the relationship is in bad shape? And, and Eve's like, well, it was the serpent's fault. And suddenly it's all about blame and shame. And they are no longer united. They have experienced separation from each other, separation from God, and then they experience loss, including losing home. Those last two verses, they have to leave the garden and they lose home. And everything they had that's what they needed is gone. But it gets even worse. Chapter 4. Chapter 4, 3 through 8, they're kids. They have Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel grow up. And Adam and Eve probably having a bunch more kids as they go. These are just the first two. And Cain and Abel grow up, and now they're adult men. And in chapter 4, verse 3 through 8, so it came about in the course of time, they've grown up, they're men now, Cain brought an offering to the Lord of fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. Now, we don't know specifically why Cain's offering was not accepted and Abel's was. By reading the rest of the story, it's probably pretty clear that Cain had the wrong attitude because it doesn't go well. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master of it. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. And so now these guys are together. They're brothers. They should love each other. And yet their relationship is strife. It's broken. It has jealousy, competition that leads to anger, that leads to murder. And once again, what are they? They're torn apart so much so that Abel loses his life. And that's even with God intervening and saying, Cain, Cain, no, this is a, this, you're not going the right way. This is a bad choice, Cain. Deal with your anger. Do the right thing. And even with God intervening, it's not enough. Cain still goes the wrong way. Jealous, angry, Murder. Now, many of us already knew these stories. But there's one more part of the story that maybe we don't. I was not familiar with it. 
but we have some of Cain's descendants. And in chapter 4, starting in verse 19, we meet Lamech, who's one of Cain's grand, great-grandsons. Lamech, Lamech, verse 19 of 4, Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabel. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother, brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. As for Zillah, she also gave birth to Tubal Cain, the forger of all implements of bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nema. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Lamech is bragging that he's worse than Cain. And Cain's not a good guy, because Cain killed his brother. Lamech says, yeah, Cain only killed one. I killed at least two. And then he hints that he's actually done more. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. And so you see how far we've fallen at this point. He's taking pride in murder. He's boasting in how wrong he is. And we have this little note. He's in a dysfunctional marriage. Why? He has two wives. And that's not God's plan. And any kind of relationship like that, we know, even from today, it struggles with what? Jealousy, competition, division. Notice how quickly. We're only in chapter 4. Everything was okay at the end of chapter 2. At the end of chapter 4, things just aren't a little broken apart. This beautiful oneness, this beautiful community has been destroyed so much so that here's a guy boasting on killing people. The family has completely fallen apart and everything has gone really, really bad. Why? It's called sin. Now, sometimes we over-religiousize the word sin. And we use it in a religious setting to mean, oh, sin, you know, bad stuff. And bad stuff is sin, for sure. But sin simply means to miss, to miss the mark, to fall short of what God has. That's all sin means. It doesn't mean, it doesn't have to be really bad, it just means not good or not good enough. 99% pure would be called sin because it falls short. And here, a little bit falls short ended up leading to a lot of falls short. Sin leads to separation. In fact, sin is separation. It divided Adam and Eve from God and from each other. It divided Cain and Abel. And it separated Abel even from life. Sin leads to separation. Sin leads to shame. Sin leads to shame. Adam and Eve, the minute they fell short of what was supposed to happen, they immediately what? Started hiding themselves. They start hiding because they feel ashamed. Sin leads to hurt between people instead of love. We're supposed to love each other. But what does sin do? It changes that love into hurt. And people get wounded. And suddenly couples, their relationship, when their relationship should all be about, their marriage should all be about love, is now about hurt which may lead to anger, resentment, frustration. Parents and children, abuse, dysfunction. The love is replaced by hurt. I have a, uh, somebody I know through uh, Twitter. I don't know them personally, but it's a young lady whose, whose father was a pastor but molested her. Now she's an adult. And her father has not only never repented, he's never admitted to it. And others turned against her when she reached out for help. And to this day, 
when it, she thinks about her father, it's, it's all about pain. It's about hurt, not about the love of a, of, of a father. Sin leads to hurt between people and so love. And finally, sin ruins community, marriage, family, and our relationship with God. It ruins it. It comes in and messes the whole thing up and tears apart. We call it sin because it misses the mark. It misses because what? We long to belong and sin interrupts that belonging. It gets in the way. It separates us out. And so then, here are our questions for application today. How have you experienced the separation of sin? How have you personally experienced the separation of sin? Perhaps you have experienced broken relationships. Perhaps you've experienced broken marriage, either either yourself or because of your folks or friends. Perhaps you've seen a division in family, a breaking of friendship. That's the thing right now, especially now, and, and, and they're actually doing studies on it in the world, not just Christians, because right now, even here in America, our times are so polarized and people are so upset about, about political things that it is causing a tear in the fabric. Families aren't speaking to each other. Friends are ceasing to be friends because of who we might support politically. To the point that people have just, friendships have ended. And that was on top of the fact that we already struggle with these things. And, and marriages have, have struggled throughout human history. And we know marriages are struggling in our world today. And family and, and, and you know, children and parents and, and, and children who, who go away from their folks. And just family friends and siblings and, you know, fighting over inheritance or, or just fighting over whatever. And then churches. How have you experienced the separation of sin? I have, I have friends who aren't speaking to me or who I can't get to communicate with me. Some of them for a long time. Because something went wrong. And they went away. And even though it's been years, it still hurts. That leads us to our second question. I always forget to put that up. Forgot the first service too. Our second question. How have you experienced shame and blame in broken community. How have you experienced shame and blame in broken community? Because once you've been in broken community, especially, you know, like if your marriage failed or a friendship failed, you may feel a great sense of shame. You may feel the judgment of others. People look down on me now. People told me I was a bad person because of what happened or what I did. And you feel great shame. We've experienced that sometimes in church. So you felt the judgment of others, or maybe you just felt a lot of guilt. Because sometimes maybe you did do something wrong, because, hey, that happens, right? Sometimes it, it was our fault. And if, it, if we did something wrong and we were stupid or we were selfish and we did something wrong and then the result was a broken relationship, we can feel tremendous guilt. And especially if we can't fix the relationship, if, if the separation stays in the relationship, you may carry around guilt for years, decades. Because you just feel bad. Because I, I messed up. And now I hurt those I love. I replaced the love with the hurt. And so that leads to our third question. How has hurt replaced love between you and others? How has hurt replaced love between you and others. That young lady I was talking about, she has trouble with being part of a church. She has trouble with pastors. Why? Because what should have been a loving relationship was replaced with hurt, and now she's protective. Why? Because that hurt was so severe that she's still struggling with that. And many people have experienced that. There are people who will not step into church. Some of them will not step into church. Why? Because they got hurt. And they got hurt in ways that they tell, I'm not ready to go back. I don't want to be a part of that ever again because it hurt. Because what should have been a loving place became a hurtful place. 
And so now they're, they're kind of permanently broken away from church. And then there are others who I bump into now and then, and I say, hey, you should come to church, and they make a comment. Usually, you know, it's a joke, but they'll say, Ari, you don't understand. If I go in, the roof will collapse. Well, why would you think that? Why? Well, because I'm pretty sure God's probably kicked at me, and if I walk into his house, I'll probably cave the place in. Why? Because I'm ashamed to come into God's presence. Now, that's not what they're thinking, but that's what they mean. Hurt replaces love. Now that's, that's the end. <laughs> we, finished, we finished part one. But I'm not going to stop there because there's no way I'm stopping a message there because we've talked about hurt and, and, and the separation. And we're going to keep going in the next week but I'm not stopping there today, even though that's, this is the point of part one, to talk about how community has been destroyed. But if you've answered these questions with examples of how you have been hurt, how you have experienced separation of sin, how you have experienced shame and blame, you need to know this. God's goal through Jesus is to return us to the original. And boy, do we need to understand that. And sometimes as church, as the church, we have not emphasized that. That God's goal is to restore intimacy and openness. To remove shame and absorb blame. To replace hurt with love by taking hurt on himself. And that's key to understanding sin and the story that we read today. We skipped over the place where God, after saying, what did you do? And they said, we hid. And it was her fault. It was his fault. It was its fault. The next thing God does is he does two things. A, he clothes them. He gives them clothing. He says, I'm going to provide for you. And then he also promises, and I'm going to fix this. I'm going to fix what's gone wrong here. And he gives the prophecy of the Messiah. He says to the woman, I'm going to put hatred between your seed, your descendant, and it's, and it's a singular, your descendant, not your descendants, and the serpent, the devil. And he is going to, your seed, your the descendant, the Messiah, is going to crush his head. Now, he will bruise his heel. He's referring to the crucifixion. The Messiah will be wounded. In taking care of this, the Messiah will be wounded, but the serpent will be destroyed. He goes, I'm going to fix this. And God's goal ever since then, and sometimes we have, we have mistaken God's goal. Because we picture God as God's trying to stamp out sin. And so he's just going to... And so what do we do as a church? We found someone who's in sin, and boom, get out of here, because we don't want any of that sin in here. And what do we do? We champion separation. And there are churches we even doubly champion separation because let us tell you how good we are at separating. We don't just stay away from sinners. We stay away from insufficiently dedicated Christians because we are going to separate ourselves. But that is not the message of the gospel. That is not what God is trying to do. God is trying to separate us from sin. By reconnecting us with himself. And sin is the problem. He's trying to remove the separation, not compound it. Because if we stay in sin, we will stay eternally separated from him. And his goal is to reverse the separation. He wants to end sin by reconnecting us. So when we do, like here, why do we do church discipline? Do we do church discipline to kick people out? No. No. Instead, our, our whole process of church discipline is to say, you have sin in your life, please separate from it and reconnect with us because sin is causing a separation and we do not want to be separate 
from you. And that is the entire message of the gospel. God doesn't say, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to get rid of you. He says, you're already broken. I want you back. Please separate yourself from the sin and let me reconnect you. I'll take care of it. I'll do it. My mission is to reconnect with you. To find, or as Jesus said, to seek and to save that which has been lost. God wants to bring us back to that, what we all want. We long to belong, and God longs to give you the place where you belong. And how does he do that? By bearing it himself. That's why I wanted to sing that song. He met us in our suffering, and he bore our shame. And he bore our sin. And he experienced separation so that we would not have to. And that is the beauty of the cross as he says, I'll bear the shame so that it can go away. And I will take the blame so it can go away. We say, God, I feel bad coming to you. God says, I took care of that. Just come. My goal is to reunite with you and and give you a place where you belong. Or what did we say? How did that song say? I have a home. I have a home. And he ends, he wants to end our story where it started, back home. We are not kicked out anymore. Sin separates us. Jesus reconnects us. The word that I taught the children there in the children's message is reconciliation. It means to bring together what has been torn apart to restore relationship. That's what God's mission is. To repent means to stop separating. To leave behind the sin that separates us and come home. Because he longs to welcome you home and to never be separated from you again. And he longs for then for us to not be separated from each other. This is not about sitting in the same room for an hour and a half worship service. It is about being reconnected, reconciled with each other. Because the sin that separates us has been dealt with by Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Now next week, we're going to look at the next part of the story. Because we've got a ways to go here. We're going to unpack all this, and we're going to show how this defines what it means not to go to church. Because you know what? There's not a verse that commands us to go to church the way we say it. We are called to be the church. And we're going to look at what does it mean? What does that mean? And what does it mean to be the church when I can't go to church? And how can I make sure that under the power of God, I am never disconnected, regardless of what I can attend? So next week, we're going to look at, as the population grows... Mankind has this longing to a longing for belonging, and they're going to try to recreate community, and they're going to do it without God. We're going to see what happens, and we're going to see community done wrong, because mankind is longing to this day to create community. We're going to see what happens when mankind tries to fix this on their own terms. Let's pray, Father, as we. As we talk to you right now, as I talk to you, Lord, if there's anyone who's been listening on the video, in person, who has been unaware of how much you love them, has been unaware that you want to reconnect with them, that you've been searching for them, 
has been unaware that the message of your Bible, not of religion, but of your Bible, that you say in your word is that you came to die, to live and to die and to come back from the dead for the purpose of forgiving us so that we could be reconnected, not because we cleaned up our act, but because you paid the price for us and that we can come into your presence boldly, not because we're good, but because you bore our shame. And so we never have to creep into your presence with our head between our knees, ashamed at who we are. Because even though we are sinners, you died for us. And you bore the shame. And you took the blame. And by your woundedness, by your separation, we are healed. And so, Lord, if there's anyone who has not accepted that, they would talk to you today. And they would stop fearing your anger or trying to fix the relationship and instead accept that you did it and trust you instead of trusting their efforts. That they would understand that you have been seeking all of us right from the moment we first walked away. Because it is your desire that we come to you and be united and reconciled. And Lord, we celebrate that we do not need to be afraid anymore. Lord, as we go forth this week, especially as we walk into an American election, Lord, our world, our, our country here in the USA is angry and they are separating. And they talk about blame and shame, Father. Oh, Father, so much blame and shame, even among the people of God. People being told that they're bad just by how they vote. Blame and shame and separation and anger. Even among your people, Lord, this should not be. Lord, may we be, as you have told us in your word, ministers of reconciliation. May we live in the moment of reconciliation that you made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might be righteous and have been reconciled to God. And then now we, having been reconciled by his blood, now we claim to them to be reconciled to you. You have given us the ministry of reconciliation. May we live that out with one another. And as much as it depends on us, may we bring that into our marriages, into our parenting or dealing with our parents, our neighbors, the people we work with. May we begin to live that life of Eden again that is not dominated by separation Blame, shame, and fear. But we live in your love expressed through your Son. Oh, Lord, we need that because we're lonely and we're, we're struggling. Thank you, Father. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a Redeemer. God's come to fix this if you will put your trust in him. Let's sing. There is a redeemer, Jesus God's own son, precious lamb of God, Messiah, oh. my Redeemer, name above all names, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, oh, for sinners slain. Thank you, oh, my Father, for giving us your 
Son, and leaving your spirit till the work on earth is done. When I stand in glory, I will see his face. There I'll serve my King forever in that holy place. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. I hope that this has been encouraging. We're going to work on this for a bit. We're going to, like I said, next week we're going to continue to be in Genesis. We're going to look at community done wrong. And then we're going to start moving into as God continues to show his plan to create community on his terms to care for us and to allow us to care for each other. And it's going to help us, I hope, encourage us on what it means for us to be the people of God and the church. Father, dismiss us with your peace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for sending your son. And Lord, now we know that you've left us here, that we might be agents of reconciliation. May that be what defines us this week. And may we see how we can spur one another on to love and good deeds, to spread your word, the good news. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's good to have you guys on the stream. If you want to come at three, we have plenty of distancing. Forget six feet. You can probably do 10 to 12. And uh, so we'd love to have you here if you want to come. We're starting uh, post-David, and it's going to be lots of intrigue. So it should be fun. So I hope you'll come out. But have a great day.